your children? Yes, sir. I am. I bet you're very proud of them. Who are they? Man believes, resulting in righteousness, 
and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the, time, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that's the gospel that Paul was preaching. Because the Jews, the Hebrews, they knew who God was. They knew the law that Moses had laid down after their deliverance from Egypt on Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments that we all learn as children in Sunday school. That's a, a loose version of what the law is. It grew from that and became much more than that. But we knew that there were some rules and some laws that God would have us follow. But part of God's promise to the people of God and to the whole world that one day he would send a redeemer that would redeem us and save us and forgive us from our sins. And Jesus is that redeemer, the Messiah, the Christ. He's mentioned as early as the book of Genesis. All through the Old Testament, they talk that one day he would come. And of course, at Christmas time, we go back and we look at all those scriptures because we know that we celebrate at Christmas the birth of Christ. We are getting ready to celebrate not only the death on the cross of Christ, but his resurrection on the Lord's day. Amen? Amen. Amen. So uh, the gospel that Paul was preaching was very distinct. And all of us here today, in some fashion, have chosen to believe the Bible, to believe God, to believe Jesus, to understand and do what we need to do to be saved. And if you are here today and you've never made one of those decisions to receive Jesus into your heart and say to him, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe God raised you from the dead. I confess you now as my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and be my Lord. Amen and amen. Amen. Now, Here's what the distortions were in that day. The Hebrews and Judaism, what they referred to often as the Judaizers in Scripture, but it was made up largely of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Some of them believed in the resurrection, some did not. Some believed this way or that way, but they were all hardcore about the law. Well, many of them had believed in Jesus and did believe that he was the Messiah. But as Paul began to take the message of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, they said, now wait, 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 hold on. That Jesus is a Jew. He was coming for the Hebrews, for the Jews. He's our Savior, our Lord. And Paul argued, oh no. He came to save the whole world, not just the Jew, not just the Hebrew, and not just the select group. And they said, well, that's the way it's going to be. Then we've got to make some rules for these Gentiles, because they can't just come sashaying in here trying to say that they can be like us. No way. And here's some of the problems that they had, and I'm only going to focus on a couple. Number one, they believed, okay, if Gentiles are going to become Christians and come, become part of this elite group that God has established in Israel, then they need to learn the law, and they need to obey the law too. And that they need to, if they sin, they need to go to the temple and offer a burnt offering. I mean, they need to do same things that we do. That was one thing that they argued very strenuously. The other thing that they argued very strenuously, that among the Hebrew men, when a, child, a baby boy child was born, he had to be circumcised on the eighth day. It was the sign of the priesthood. Now, I know I, I can get into sermons on that. I'm not going to this morning. But the point of the matter was, it was one of the laws, it was one of the rules. And they said, if these Greeks are going to come in, they need to be, these men need to be circumcised too. And Paul says, no. They're not Hebrews. They're not Jews. They did not come from the same past you have come from. They have come strictly to receive Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. And so the argument went on. And so when Paul refers to where we read here in the first chapter of Galatians and said that there are some among you that would distort the gospel, they were saying, well, you not only need to receive Jesus 
Jesus Christ. But you also need to do this, and you need to do that, and you need to do this, and you need to do that also. And Paul said, no, 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 that's not the way it works. So I'm going to share with you some scriptures this morning that, that, that are all through the New Testament that help us sort of to get a grip on some of the things they were struggling with. For example, in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Do you think, Jesus, Jesus was speaking, do you think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets? I did not come to abolish, I came to fulfill. Jesus was the fulfillment of the law that Moses had established for the Hebrews. Folks, it's impossible to follow the Ten Commandments and all of the law they had into that. No man can do that. And we have proven for generations and generations, literally thousands of years, that we cannot do that. Jesus did it. And in Him, He had, as God's Son, He fulfilled. Here's another one. In Romans chapter 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. We know what sin is as a result of what the law is telling us what to do and what not to do. So when we do sin, we know that we have sinned and we need to do something about it. You follow that? Then look at what John said in chapter 1, verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Here's another one from Titus. What they're talking about is grace. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. And all through the New Testament, there is argument after argument after confirmation after confirmation that, that salvation is all about grace. All about grace. For by grace, you have been saved by faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So here's the, here's the deal. God sent His Son, Jesus, to dwell among us and to teach us the truth by grace. We have an opportunity to embrace those things. And when He died on the cross, it wasn't because He was being punished for His sin. He went to the cross and bore the cross, and bled on the cross, and died on the cross for our sin. Amen. Like before the Hebrew would have to go to the temple and give a burnt offering for their sin, that there had to be a death and shed blood for a sin. Now Jesus died and shed his blood once and for all, for all sin, for all men who would receive him as Savior and Lord. Amen. Now, there's some distortion in the gospel today. Even among Gentiles, even in the United States, even in the world of Christianity, there are some distortions. And we need to look at them and we need to call them what they are. For example, we teach to be baptized. Amen. Baptism in water. Do you have to be baptized to be saved? No. No, you don't. Does God want you to be baptized? <laughs> yes. Yes, He does. Now, how do we know that we don't have to be baptized to be saved? The best example in the whole book was on the day that Jesus died on the cross. He had a thief, a thief on both sides of him. One of them was laughing at him. And the other one said, Jesus, don't pay any attention to that guy. But remember me when you come into your glory and your kingdom. And remember what Jesus said to him? Today you will be with me in paradise. Now, I don't think that guy crawled down off that cross and got baptized before he died. No, he was never baptized. Baptized, uh, Christianity and salvation is based on the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Our exception our acceptance, acceptance of it and our confession of his name and sin. Baptism is not what saves us. It's not part of salvation. But it is our testimony. 
When we are baptized, we are literally going into the water. How many people I've said this to? Buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. And they come up sputtering and everything, and they say, hallelujah, you know, I've been baptized. It's a symbol of what has already taken place in our lives. Death, burial, and resurrection. And it becomes our testimony, because when you are baptized, you are literally saying to everybody that's there and watching, I have decided to follow Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, uh, there's, there are some churches today. There's churches in Pomona. There's churches in, all over California that believe that you cannot be saved unless you are baptized. Okay, I'm not going to put them down or call names. That's just not what the Bible says. Period. I'm sorry, but it's not what the Bible says. Now, another issue. Church membership. Do you have to join a church to be saved? No. Nope. Do you have to come to church to be saved? No. Nope. Do nope. you have to tithe to be saved? No. Nope. No. But does, would God like you to do these things? Amen. Sure. sure. We need to come to church. We need to fellowship and worship and praise the Lord together. We need to be part of a church, part of a Christian family. But we don't have to do those things to be saved. But let's face it, folks, if you're really a Christian, you're going to want to, right? Amen. Please say amen. 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 Right? Okay. Now, there are some churches right here in Pomona, right here in California, all of them, that believe that if you're going to be a Christian, you have to be a member of that church. There are also churches that teach that you get into heaven and receive your salvation by work. In other words, the more you work, the more points you get, and you find your way into heaven. Now, that same church believes, and I use the term church loosely, but that same group believes that only 144,000 people are going to make it into heaven. And that's what they believe, and that they teach it. Folks, they have the right to do that and, and, and believe what they choose to believe. But that's not what the Bible says. Amen. Because that's the scripture that I just read. For by grace you have been saved through faith. So our salvation, this gospel that we receive and accept, is by grace. And God, that we can't do anything of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works. Lest any man should boast. One time I had a couple of those people come to my door. And uh, usually I don't take the time to talk with them because I can just see the little clock going up. No, there's another one. There's another man. There's another, you know. And so I said, you, have you got a Bible with you? And, and they said, wait a second. I said, turn in there to Ephesians chapter 2. You see down there where it says verses 8 and 9? Would you read that to me? Oh, I'd be happy to. And, and I said, see, that's how you become a Christian. And they said, well, well yes, but I mean, you have to. And, and they got quite flustered. And I wasn't trying to make fun of them or anything. But we need to know what is truth and what is not truth. We need to know what is truth and what is a lie. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. You, if you don't believe it, you need to start believing it. Satan is alive and well and working in this world today. And he works overtime in an effort to make us believe a lie. Amen. And he's working everywhere and he's very good at what he does. And we don't want to be tricked. We don't want our kids to be tricked. We don't want our families to be tricked or our neighbors. We want them to know the truth. And that's why Baptists, and I'm not saying Baptist is the only one, this is a Baptist church, any church that preaches the true gospel of Jesus Christ, we are considered people of the book. What does the book say? And that's what we preach. The true, unblemished word of God. And that's what we preach in the gospel. Don't add to it. Don't make it something that it's not. But here's the bottom line. And most of you that are here, I know, I know most of you have made this decision. The bottom line, first of all, is that you have to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. First step, okay, I'm going, to, I, I'm going to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. 
I believe I need to do that. I believe God is leading me to do that. And then you need to believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead. Because if you don't believe God raised you from the dead, you're in a lot of trouble. Because then the gospel is not complete. You follow me? Amen. You have to receive Jesus. But you have to believe what God did through Jesus as a result of our salvation. So that our sins can justifiably be forgiven. Well, God wants us to be saved. Wants us to be genuinely saved, forgiven of sin, and become a believer. And operate and serve God in that way. You know, uh, becoming a Christian brings with it some responsibility. Um, I have a lot of fun with my email address because I chose an email address that always brings up a question. Because somebody's always asking you for your email address, right? Come on. Amen. All the time. Amen. My email address is phil16dj at yahoo.com. Phil. One six. So they, they look at that and they said, Phil, one six, what's that? And I said, that stands for Philippians one six. It's my life scripture. For I believe, for I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And they said, is that in the Bible? I said, yes it is in the book of Philippians. And I said, you need to read the Bible and you need to find Jesus. With my email address, it's an opening to share the gospel. There are all kinds of things that you can do to be responsible and share with people the gospel without getting in their face and making them uncomfortable and causing them to come back, back away and say, well, there's another Christian for you after me. You know, you don't have to do that. You can be very subtle and just share the, the gospel of Jesus Christ in little ways that they don't even, and they will go away thinking about it too. They will not be able to forget what you told them. Another good one is to say, somebody's talking about um, Christianity and, and maybe they're not a believer and they say, I just don't know if, if, you know, if there's really a God. Remember, remember we grew up in the days when, when the, the word was going around, God is dead? Remember that? Amen. Now it doesn't matter. Well, uh, whether there's a God or not, we don't need him anymore. That's the attitude today. But there are a lot of people that, you know, they're not sure there's a God and so a good word to say to them is, well, you know what? Let's just say, for example, you die. You die today. And you find yourself standing in front of the throne of God. And he asks you and says, okay, why should I let you into my heaven? What are you going to tell him? Well, I don't think that's going to happen to me. But what if it does? What are you going to tell him? What are you going to say to the God of the universe, the creator of the universe, when you have rejected everything he offered to you on earth, how are you going to get into heaven with no word of truth? So there are a lot of things, folks, that are important with regard to the gospel. We need to know the gospel. We need to practice the gospel. We need to embrace the gospel. And we need to share the gospel. Amen? Amen. I'm serious. I was listening, most of you know that I listen to Christian radio because I drive a lot. It takes me about an hour to get here from my home and then an hour home. So I listen to k -Wave. And I, I like to listen to J. Vernon McGee and Jim Smith. Oh, Jim Smith. <laughs> that's, that's a different one. I've been Chuck Smith. Chuck Smith. And I, the other day, I was listening to Rick Warren. You know, maybe you heard of Rick Warren? Amen. He's the pastor of Saddleback, uh, Saddleback Church over in uh, Lake Forest. By the way, and I'm not a Christian Baptist, I'm really not, but did you know that Saddleback is a Baptist church? Amen. So, so you church. may not know that, but it is. Rick Warren and I used to be associate pastors at the same church. Now, I don't know what happened to me, but he went there. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, um, he was preaching about keys to success. And I thought, wow, this sounds very interesting. So I was, looking, I was driving along, listening, and, and so he said, number one, here's the first thing that you need to know. 
Know who you are. Amen. Know who you are. You know, there's some depth to that question, isn't there? Do you really know who you are today? Well, if you are a believer, you are a child of the King. You are a joint heir to the throne. You are a servant of God that when you get to heaven are going to reserve, uh, receive a gold crown from God himself. Did you know that? I mean, this is real stuff. God wants you and receives you and is going to bless you. And many of us are blessed beyond, uh, blessed beyond what we can even understand here on earth already. Amen. And can you imagine how we're going to be blessed in, in heaven? We were talking in prayer meeting Thursday night about how things have changed in our lifetime. I was born in 1944. Now, don't you go back and that up. And I, remember, I, of course, I don't remember anything from 1944, but when I go back, I know that World War II ended in 1945. And I found out some things that were happening around my birth, you know, and like that. Well, when I was pastor of this church the first time, I was here from 19, <clears throat> 1995 to 2001. We had a lady in this church named Frances Wolf. Anybody remember Frances Wolf? Okay. She came to California with her mom and dad in a covered wagon. Settled in Pomona and came to this church. Now, if she was alive today, she'd be over 100 years old. She passed away a few years ago, several years ago. But I always have remembered that. And I thought, wow, are you talking about somebody that has seen some things change? I mean, if I was going to come to California today, I'd, you know, I'd fly, or go by train, or drive a new Cadillac. I mean, you know, something. But a covered wagon? Isn't that amazing? Can you imagine all of the things that she saw through her lifetime? And think back, all of the things that we've seen in our lifetime. When I was here the first time, my wife and I were so proud because we got our first cell phone. You needed a suitcase to carry it in. It was like a brick. I mean, you carry it, and, and, and we were so proud because we had a plan. You got 30 minutes a month on that phone. And of course, there was no texting. And sometimes it would actually work. But look at the phone today that you've got. You can take pictures. You can go on the internet. You can send email. You can play games. You can do this. You can do that. And just the, just the phone alone, how it has changed. Automobiles have that change. I was telling them on Thursday night, I remember. And I know, I know Joe, you probably remember something like this. I know Dean, you do too. Carrying your duffel bag, heading for the airport or the boat or some train to take off and head off for parts unknown during, during the war, during the time you were in the service. I remember mine. I was at L.A. airport, had my duffel bag on my shoulder, walking through the door, and I was going to be taking a plane to the Southeast Asia. And I came out, and there was this plane. I couldn't even see the top of the tail on it because I'd never been on it. And I looked at it, and on the side it said, Flying Tigers. That was the branch of the Air Force in World War II that my dad flew for. And I looked at that, and I thought, I, the connection immediately touched me. And I thought, my dad, my dad was with the Flying Tigers, and here I am leaving on a plane, Flying Tigers. That was awesome. But the point was, I saw this plane. And, and I remember how I got to the airport. We came on a bus. You know? And on all the things that have changed. Is there anybody here that's never been on a plane? You never have been? You never have been? You never have been? And maybe you're probably saying in your heart, and I never will be. <laughs> <laughs> but just that alone, look at how it has changed. Look how cars have changed. Look how traffic has changed. But you know what? Most of all, most of all, look how people's attitudes have changed. 
Amen. Look how people's demonstration of friendliness and love has changed. We live in a different world than what we were born into. We're here to either make it worse or better. I choose to make it better. Because every time we share about Jesus and share this gospel that we've been talking about, it makes the world better. Would you stand with me, please? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here today and you have never asked Jesus Christ into your heart, you've never asked him to forgive you of your sins, never decided to follow Jesus or become a Christian. If you've never done it, would you just slip? No one's looking around you, just me. I'm would you raise your hand and say, I've never done it. Raise your hand. Okay, one is raising their hand right now. One is raising their hand. Anybody else? Okay. You put your hand down. If you're here today and you are a Christian, and you want to say, you know, Pastor, I'm just not doing all that I should be doing as a Christian. I'm not serving the Lord as I know He wants me to serve Him. If you can say that today, and remember, no one's looking around, I want to pray for you because I want you to be all that God wants you to be. Could you just slip your hand and say, Pastor, let's pray for you? Because I need, yes, I see you and you and you and you. I, and I see you and you. I'm going to pray for all of you. Now, one more thing of prayer. If you have a burden on your heart today for some unsaved person, family member, neighbor, that you know needs to be saved, and you've been praying for them and nothing has happened yet, and so I know you're here, and we're praying for Bobby. We've been praying for Bobby for a long time. Anybody else? Raise your hand and say yes. Yes, I've got somebody that needs Jesus. You, 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 and you, and you, and you, all over. Yes, you, you. Heavenly Father, you've seen the hands that have been raised. Oh God, touch our hearts today and help us to be the people you've called us to be. Yes, Lord. Heavenly Father, help us to serve you with a spirit of innocence and determination. Help us to be the people you've called us to be. Help us to know who we are. Help us to be everything you've asked us to be in Jesus. That are praying for loved ones who are unsaved. We pray for them right now. We don't know them by name, but you do. You know their hearts. You know the intention that was made when that those hands were raised. We pray for those people that need Jesus, that these folks that are here are concerned about and want them to be saved. We pray for them and lift them up right now in the name of Jesus, that they might be saved and come to know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior.
stunt us well. Yeah, well, Father, we just pause and take this moment to reflect on you and the word that came down from our high today to our ears. Lord, we just rejoice in your word. And Lord, as we go along from this place, we ask that you continue to abide within us, your Holy Spirit, be more and more real to each other among us. And Lord, we just thank you for this time and this fellowship. Give you all the honor, glory, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.